Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to podcast number three in part two in our Flat Earth series. Now, Ian, I don't see the uh, the notes here, but uh, we'll just get going with this. Want to welcome everybody. I'm your host, Al Vashon, with, of course, Ian Juby. Uh, you probably know Ian from his multi-platform all over social media and YouTube and everything else. How are you doing tonight, Ian? I'm not too bad, Al. How about yourself? Are you, are you what? I'm oh, okay. fantastic. I was looking forward to this. I was looking forward to this one tonight. So, uh, you know, I hear that we've got over 5,000 or, or thousands anyway of views from the last podcast. And there was a, a, some anticipation of what's coming up tonight uh, with part two of the Flat Earth. Is that right? Uh, yes. And uh, you're you're starting to glitch Excellent. again. So before before we go very far... Let us remember, remind everybody, let me call it up on the screen here, uh, with, if we get cut off, <laughs> uh, stop screen, where did it go? I have it here. If we get cut off, and if you can hear me, uh, <laughs> you want to re-log in, you want to go to rumble.com forward slash user forward slash Ian Juby forward slash live to get back onto the feed. It'll take you to the latest feed. Uh, live feed that's ready to go for us. So if we get cut off, you, the, there's a link on the screen. Just join us at rumble.com forward slash user forward slash Ian Juby and forward slash live. All righty. Yes. And I'm, uh, so I'm I, uh, sorry. Do you have your, your stuff up there? I have my stuff up here. So um, go for let it. Me get into it. All right. So tonight's topic is the flat earth. Uh, last week, we looked at some experiments, some observations, and uh, we had a lot of comments come in and so on and questions. And we looked at that part of it. But this week, we're going to focus on sort of the biblical aspect. And what does the Bible say about a flat earth? Can we really determine um, if the earth is flat or if it's a globe just using scripture? Uh, we have the observations. We have the tests. We have all of that. But what does the Bible say? And that's what we're going to take a look at tonight. But before we get into it, I just want to preface this one with something. Does it really matter? You saw in the opening here, uh, one of the questions really was, does it matter if the earth is flat or if it's uh, a globe? And on the Bible side of it, as a Christian, to us, it really doesn't make a difference. Um, and the reason I say this is salvation isn't by believing whether the earth is flat or a globe. It comes from the Savior, Jesus Christ, and believing in his uh, life, death, and resurrection to forgive your sins. So on the biblical side of it, absolutely, it makes no difference. But what does the world say? What do you say? What do the scientists say? And tonight we're looking at what the Bible says. So we've got a number of scriptures, and I, I, I want to get into this just a moment here and state that, you know, there are over 200 uh, pieces of scripture in the Bible that speak about We'll say flat earth or globe earth. And I want to say both because I would say over 90% of them are very vague in the sense that it can be used for either a globe earth or to describe a flat earth. So they're really, they play on each other. And both sides can use those scriptures uh, or those passages to, I guess, um, what do you want to say? I guess to push their side and their belief system. Really, it's a worldview, right? So we're talking about uh, Flat Earth, and we're talking about the Bible tonight. Uh, before we get into it, Ian. Yeah, we're going to back you. up a hair. <laughs> we're backing so, uh, up a hair, people. Yeah, we're going to back up a hair. So uh, in the uh, so Rumble, as, you, as many of you have already remembered from last week, so YouTube has what they call the Super Chats. Uh, Rumble has their Rumble Rants, and you can uh, send a tip. Right now, 100% uh, is going to the creators for the rest of the year from Rumble. Um, normally, Rumble takes 20% off the off of that, and so it supports us, uh, supports the production of these podcasts, especially because, so I haven't even told Al this yet. Okay, so for everybody, um, uh, this next week, I will be at Canada, I believe it's Canada's largest homeschool conference. Uh, AHIA, Alberta, Alberta mm. Home Educators Association in Red Deer. And I did manage to catch up with Bill Gibbons. So uh, next week, 
Um, I will hopefully be interviewing Bill Gibbons for the podcast. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with him or forget what the scoop was there, Bill Gibbons was uh, has gone into the Congos of Africa multiple times in search of a creature that for the world sounds like a sauropod dinosaur, still alive today in the Congos of Africa. And they call it Mokili and Bembi. And uh, we also, after our Bill C-11 emergency podcast there, uh, we did have one viewer write in asking about this duck-billed creature that sure sounds like the duck-billed hadrosaurs, the duck-billed dinosaurs um, out of Australia. Uh, so I, I sent that question to Bill as well. We'll see what he says. But uh, so that's that's on the agenda for next week. It may or may not be live. <laughs> So it may be pre-recorded, but I'm bringing my microphones with me, and uh, I'm looking forward to that very much. Uh, Al, you have your, uh, let me see if I can haul it up here, your TikTok channel, which is just huge. <laughs> yes. Um, let me, uh, what, why don't you tell, first of all, what is your TikTok handle? Like when, it was uh, Al underscore open. Vashon. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Al underscore Vashon. Um, I, I'll give you a little bit of a background. I've uh, I've been a Christian, born again Christian now since uh, 1998, and have studied the Bible. Just I I, I just can't get enough. Um, it seems that the the Lord has been pulling me closer and closer and closer to Him. And I just can't get enough of scripture. So I've, I'm, I've, I'm learning as I go. I'm growing in the faith. I'm always, I'm always learning new things, but I'm always researching uh, different topics. And this one always has um, interest me. Uh, TikTok was a win. So my daughter one day she approached me and said, Dad, you should do TikTok videos. You used to be in radio. You've done a lot of radio voiceover work and all of this stuff. I bet you your TikTok would take off. And for the longest time, me and I, I kind of brushed it off. And I said, no, I don't have time. No, I don't think there'd be interest. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure about this TikTok thing. And then finally, after, oh, I want to say about five or six weeks, on a whim, I said, mm -hmm. okay, let's do one. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, here we are a few months later. And I think there was just under 40,000 followers, subscribers. And uh, yep. some, of the, some of the videos have uh, really gone viral with half a million views here, 400,000 here, and mm -hmm. so on. So mm -hmm. this is where we stand. And and many of the TikTok uh, followers, my TikTok family, have actually approached me to do a podcast. And uh, going into ministry and so on, we'll talk about that. And, of course, uh, being yep. a, a part of CORE, it seems to be fitting to uh, kind of go in this direction. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I forgot to mention yep. that too, by the way, for uh, everybody uh, watching. So Val, Al, uh, I, I've known Al for a number of years now. He's he done he's done voiceover work for many many moons, and he also did uh, voiceovers uh, for like cartoon voices. And of course, I'm producing a children's animated show. So he was he's like the voice for Tony the T Rex in my in my children's show, for example, um, which has been on the docket for oh, I've been working on that for like eleven years now. Um, but uh, yeah, okay. So you and your wife, you're you're heading out on the road. What what can you tell us about that? This is just coming up in the future. Uh, you're heading out for on the road in ministry, in full time ministry. Well. That's right. So uh, on a whim, we start, not on a whim, I guess we've been talking about this for quite some time. We looked at um, uh, RVs, full drivable RVs, and we, we recently purchased a 35-foot RV. And one of the things that I'm feeling led to do is a, a mobile ministry, is going from town to town, having a, a, a mobile ministry where I can actually speak at churches and schools and to groups uh, of all sorts and, uh, and minister to them and talk about the Gospels and talk about the importance of it. Talk about who we are and where we are and where we're going. And it just seems to be the right direction that the Lord has been pulling me into. And so strongly that I actually resisted until um, one day I just kind of woke up and said, why am I resisting? This is this is your will, not mine. And so that's it. So it's all in, in development right now. We will have social media, YouTube, all of the other uh, social media sites 
um, that you can follow us on that. You'll see that coming up in future podcasts. And of course, the first place you're coming coming with the RV and doing a podcast is here. Exactly. <laughs> so okay, and th- thanks for all those who are I, chiming I think in. It's funny. Okay, okay, absolutely. Uh, thanks for those who are coming chiming in on the contents uh, comments. By the way, um, uh, so Beans mentioned I watched the flat earther film the sun go all the way around the south pole i i was going to get to that and claimed that that was proof that the earth was flat uh because we didn't see retrograde motion we'll we'll discuss that later on but thanks beans i i did also ask uh, my buddy john who's actually been to antarctica and i asked if he could chime, chime in tonight i don't know if he got my message or not uh we'll see if he uh actually gets here today um <laughs> So, so far, it looks like Facebook is letting me go live. <laughs> oh, dude, my fo- my Facebook friend, he's posted a couple hours Ooh. ago. He's like, uh, quick, click the like button for 40 times and tell me what you see. So like an idiot, I'm like, okay. <laughs> Your account's been restricted for one hour. Dude, <laughs> you jerk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to go live on Facebook. I can't have this my account restricted right now. So anyway, like an idiot. Anyway, and uh, I see Tino is uh, commenting. I'll have to catch up later. Got to go meet some friends. I only have a few, so I can't stand them up. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, so, um, now, last week, <laughs> we had uh, we had a whole mess of comments. I think it was 89 comments submitted after the podcast. Um, so let's, uh, let me, wow. is that one? I think that's one. Which is great. It Some is. of this I wasn't privy to. I'm learning as we go. So that's great. Yes. Yes. So this, uh, Ken Freak, uh, posted this. The science plainly shows us that gravity would prevent a flat earth from ever forming. Ever see a flat planet in the solar system? No. Now, this is a very significant point that he's brought up here. And we we didn't get into gravity last week. I specifically dodged the topic for the moment. <laughs> uh, I, all I did was mention that I had unconventional views of gravity. But gravity is a big problem. And he's nailed, he's hit the nail on the head here. This is one of the big problems. However, another viewer wrote in. Oops, wrong button. There we go. Flat earthers don't believe the earth is an upside down mountain floating in space. Now, I, I agree with them on that. Uh, if you guys will recall, um, last year I, uh, or last week, I showed a, an image where it, it looked, it looked just like that, an upside down mountain, right? And it was just, it was just an image. I wasn't trying to say anything by it. Um, but it was just an image I posted for the thumbnail, right? And I, I agree with them on that point. Um, They believe the light is bending through a half-sphere electromagnetic dome rather than the land and water bending. That's very, very important. I'm well aware that that is what they believe, or one of the things they believe. Some. (laughs) Here we're going to make the disclaimers again, okay? Because get a load of what he says next. They believe the sun, moon, and stars and wandering stars are smaller and in the firmament that dome that we talked about last week or didn't talk about last week, you misrepresented what they believe to make it easy to pick apart because a ball earth is obviously fake. We don't live on a giant ball, water ball in a vacuum shooting at 2 million mile an hour. All right. So first of all, thanks for the comment, Deer Park 777. Um, Obviously I have to disagree on a lot of points here, but um, these these were the guys uh, that were disagreeing with the other flat earthers last week. Now I don't think it was him, but there was another flat earther that basically said when I when I uh, retorted when they complained about the image, which actually you know what? Give me one second. I will call up that image. There it is, right there, so that everybody can see. Uh, it was a hot topic. It was, it was. And I hope everyone will be patient with me here. We're using StreamYard this week because, uh, last week OBS studio was giving me 
all kinds of hard, hard times and we had echoes and stuff. So, so this was the image that I was using as the thumbnail. And what I was looking at specifically was the layout of the land masses, which the, the critics over on Gab agreed with me on that one. They said, yeah, that's pretty much accurately represents what they believe. And now, now of course they would also say, talk emphatically about the dome. But when I said, they said, they claimed that there was no flat earthers who believed this model. Uh, I said, I actually know of several. And they promptly retorted that, well, they're just stupid. That, those were their words, not mine. Okay. Uh, and you guys, you guys, you flat earthers in attendance, you'll notice that neither Al nor myself have ever called you stupid. Not once. And we're not going to either. Okay. Um, but this gives you the kind of uh, the idea of the kind of quality of arguments that are coming out. OK, so when you got flat earthers each, eating each other alive here, um, I, I just I just completely disregard them. But regardless, coming back to um, what Deer Park said, uh, when he mentions, you know, we don't live on a giant water ball uh, shooting in a vacuum shooting through space at 2 million mile an hour. Actually, with a flat Earth, it's an exceptionally, uh, grossly more difficult problem. And I didn't touch on this last week, but as uh, the first guy mentioned, um, if you have gravity, it is going to suck all that matter into a ball as we understand gravity, okay? Uh, for example, we can look around uh, in the... Uh, in our own solar system, uh, let me make this bigger. We can look around in our own solar system and see round planets, globe planets, and even globe moons. This is Jupiter. And to give you an idea, again, last week we emphasized over and over again, this is stuff you can do at home. This is research you can do at home. You know how this picture was taken out? This was through binoculars. How was that? And you were looking at, you were looking at oh, Jupiter there you go. Really? and four four of its moons through binoculars. So you don't need Amazing. really sophisticated Amazing. equipment. Okay. So if you've got if you've got even a, a half decent telescope, it's amazing what you can see, and you can track those individual obviously globe moons and you know that they are globes because you can look at them and you can track them in orbits around the planet you can watch it you can do this from home with even a cheap telescope so his his point uh the first guy is i've forgotten his name uh but the first guy's point about gravity making everything into a ball is quite correct and if you do not have that then you've got a bigger problem uh, because gravity, what at least the flat earthers that I've debated with, what they claim is that it is an acceleration. I, in many ways, actually agree with them on this. And as I mentioned last week, and I will steer clear away from again, is that I personally have unconventional views of gravity. It's an observation. We can measure it. We can observe it. It's very consistent, but nobody really knows how it works or why it works, I should say. Okay. That's it's right. assumed right. that matter just has a gravitational field. So you get more matter, it's a stronger gravitational field. That's that's the current thinking. Is it right? I don't know. Uh, personally, I believe I have generated a gravitational field in the lab using electricity. Uh, I won't go into that. But uh, let's say, let's take their hypothesis and run with it. Let's say the Earth is flat and it's accelerating. Forget the reasons why, forget everything, okay? It's accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared. Have you ever gone skydiving or bungee jumping? No, no. What, it's it's okay. on my to-do list, but no, I haven't. Excellent, excellent. Okay, when do you do? Gravity takes over real fast. <laughs> that 9.8 yeah, yes, meters per second squared, it's pretty serious, dude. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, like, wow. Um, even just falling off a ladder, it's like, wow, that was fast. 
<laughs> so, so bear in mind, this is per second squared. So for, so per second, per second. Okay. So if we have a 6,000 year old earth, I won't get into the math of it's billions of years old. Okay. We'll steer clear of that one because the numbers will be too big for the screen. A 6,000 year old earth would be 189. That's trillion, right? 100 or billion, 189 billion, 216 million seconds. So you take that number, multiply it by 9.8 meters per second, would mean that the current velocity of a 6,000 year old flat earth would be, well, what is that, trillion? 100,000 million billion trillion, 1.8 trillion meters per second, okay? And climbing at 9.8 meters per second squared. So by comparison, the speed of light is a mere 299 million meters per second. So we would literally be well in excess of the speed of light. Not only that, you have our entire solar system, which we can observe from our backyard, which also must be accelerating in the same direction in unison with us. So it isn't just Earth, because Jupiter, like I showed you, all its moons, Saturn, its moons, which you can see from your backyard, all the other planets, the sun, all of them have to go in unison. Now, are they in the, the dome firmament? That's another argument. Uh, which I won't get into uh, yet, um, but this is this is a major major problem for the flat Earth uh, is gravity. Uh, in regards to that, we got one more comment I wanted to touch on. Before I move on, oh yes, okay, I think I know who this is. Uh, Red Knight well, Scott. Just, just, oh, you got it. Yep. You were going to say something? I was just going to add to that. That's one of the uh, things. Yeah, one of the Bible verses I was looking at, just to touch on your point, is uh, 1 Chronicles 1630. Uh, and it shows a clear oh, yes. contradiction to what they teach, uh, simply because of the acceleration that you were speaking of at 9.8 um, meters squared, uh, meters per second squared. Um, how they tremble before him, all the earth, the world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Now, one of the teachings, it's a popular right. teaching along among flat earthers, is that the earth, the, the disk, is actually accelerating at a constant rate. Mm -hmm. But wait a minute, that contradicts the, the Bible verse that states that it cannot be moved. Well, if it's accelerating mm -hmm. at 9.8 meters squared, uh, meter second, meters per second squared, then that contradicts exactly what the Bible says. That's one of the the Bible verses that I wanted to bring up and cover. And your explanation yeah, just there uh, kind of brought me right to Chron 1 Chronicles 16.30. That's that's a good point, because I actually heard that very verse just today cited by a flat earther, actually, in support of yep. the flat earth concept, actually. Um, that's, that's actually a good point. I hadn't thought of that. Uh, so... Red Sky, Red Night Skies had wrote in as well. Uh, I'm a ham operator. He's he's not the only one that said this. Uh, I've had a couple of hams, ham radio operators say this. I'm a ham radio operator. Uh, the experiments I have done with repeaters and balloons has shown the Earth is a sphere. If the Earth was flat, the altitude of the balloons would be a fraction of their height to increase operation range. Why can I not see the North Star? from Australia. Anyway, uh, so that's it for the questions and comments from last week that I wanted to cover. Um, so uh, tell you what, Al, why don't we go to your Bible verses? I'll call them up on the screen here. And yeah, we, we, we looked at that, that one in one Corinthians, uh, one chronicle, sorry. Um, however, it brings there, me to right another there. one, and we don't have to go in order here. I want to, I want to kind of get into it. Sure, you got it. There you go. Yep, so it happens to be the first one. Them, you can see that the, the, a lot of the verses, um, exactly. So, a lot of the verses are actually, uh, either they're metaphoric, you can either uh, take it as a metaphor or a simile. 
they're not, when people say, do you believe in the Bible verbatim? Do you believe it actual? Do you, you know, do you take it word for word? Yes and no, but there are metaphors. Jesus used metaphors, metaphors and similes. Uh, that first one is exactly that in 1 Chronicles, when he says the world is firmly established and cannot be moved. But wait a minute, whether we're talking about a flat earth or globe earth, it's moving. According to both worldviews, the earth is moving. Clear metaphor, and many, many, many of the verses, we can't look at the 200 that they, they state uh, really push for the flat earth. Um, but again, I can discredit probably 95, 98% of them simply because you can use them for both flat and globe earth uh, worldviews. Um, but the next one, and one of the biggest ones they talk about is Isaiah eleven twelve. 12. Um, now, before I read the Bible verse, I want you to keep one thing in mind, is in Isaiah eleven twelve, 12, this would almost place nations along the their ice wall. Now, if you think about it, the flat earth, you have the land masses, you have the oceans, and then the entire flat earth is surrounded by a 1,000 high. Uh, they don't know the length of it, but it's an ice wall that surrounds the entire flat earth. And one of, their, one of the, the most common Bible verses that they use is Isaiah eleven twelve, And it states here, he will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four corners or the four quarters of the earth. If they're scattered among the four corners of the earth, according to flat earthers, there's either just an ice wall or there's an ice wall and then the four angels on the four corners. So there's a circle and as it will, uh, as it, as it were, like a roulette wheel with its four corners. But this, this passage that they use would also imply that there are nations along the four corners of the earth, which would be their ice wall. Uh, so again, it, it, right. it's a, it's a clear metaphor saying that Israel as a nation, when it was scattered, when the uh, temple was destroyed in 70 AD, the peoples were scattered throughout the world. It mm -hmm. wasn't to the four corners of the world as in an ice wall. It was nations beyond Israel. And this is what the, the passage clearly shows. So this is one of them. Hmm. I'm just checking the comments here. And also on that note, um, give me one second here. I'm multitasking, whereas Vance Nelson tells me unitasking. Um, <laughs> uh, there there was the jupster. <laughs> My uh, my one Facebook friend uh, this past week sent me a list, and I I asked her about this because the moment she mentioned this, I'm like I pre I'm pretty sure I know exactly what um exactly what list she's referring to, and it was a list a legend an alleged list of over 200 flat earth Bible verses. And uh, I had actually gotten this list given to me several years right. ago. And um, I, I only mentioned it because uh, as I went through this list, first of all, uh, my understanding now, I have not been able to verify this, but I also haven't been able to refute it. Uh, when I was first given this several years ago, I was told this was actually compiled by atheists. And that they were, they compiled this list in order to uh, make it appear as though the Bible taught a flat earth. Um, like there's many, many verses here, like, like uh, sun stops moving, like in Joshua or Isaiah and, and Habakkuk. And not Habakkuk, as I always used to say, it's uh, <laughs> Habakkuk. <laughs> um, that, that could, it's a miracle. The sun stopping moving is a miracle. It's irrelevant whether it's a flat earth or a spherical earth. It's a miracle. The sun stops moving. <laughs> so, I mean, stuff like that. Or the sun moving backwards in 2 Kings. It Again, it's a miracle. What does that have to do with the shape of the earth? Absolutely nothing. And, in fact, the vast majority of these verses had absolutely nothing to do with the shape of the earth. 
It was either miraculous or uh, oftentimes it was symbolic. It was in prophetic words, for example, um, mm-hmm. things like that. So, uh, but anyway, I, I, I'm glad she sent that to me because I, uh, uh, I was going to bring this up anyway. Um, but go for it. You take a look at it yourself and take a look at the verses in, in context as well. Like a lot of these are, you know, prophetic, like Nebuchadnezzar's dream, um, for example. Uh, anyway, that was sorry, I got sidetracked again there. I'll... No, that's fine. And what... you know, this is what I find: the more research I do on flat Earth and their belief system or their the worldview, the more I find that the passages that they use to support their hypothesis are passages that are picked and chosen. They're sol- Selected specifically just that section to fit that worldview. But if you read, if you take it really into context and you read the entire chapter, uh, you'll see that it doesn't actually support the flat earth whatsoever. Right. And also, um, oh. Sorry. Ah, there we go. Okay, you're back. You totally froze. Go on. I froze. Say everything after yeah, blah, so blah, blah. I was just I, I, I'm not sure what you heard but basically uh all the research that I've done uh, with flat earthers they pick and choose just bits and pieces of Bible verses and if you read it in context and you read the entire chapter uh I don't think in in my research that any of it supports a flat earth uh I've got a lot of examples here we can go through um it's, more specifically it's it's to pick at the ice wall. And this is one that, that haunts me in a sense, because this is the one that I see zero uh, ammunition, as it were, for to support a flat earth. And I, I can get into it. And we'll get into it very shortly. But yeah, it's I just find that they pick and choose little bits and pieces to fit their hypothesis. But when you read it in, in, in its entirety, it doesn't. It breaks down. Right, right. And Beans is just uh, commenting in the chats there. Uh, most of these verses were never speaking of the earth as a planet, but the land on which the people live or the people themselves. Uh, for mm-hmm. instance, when it says the earth shakes or the earth is immovable, it's talking about earthquakes and the fact that the land doesn't fall out uh, from beneath our feet, which uh, I, I agree. That's a good point. Um, Absolutely. Also- it's actually, a, it's a great point. I was going to say that if you, the word earth in the Bible, um, it actually refers to the actual um, land mass and not the actual planet as a whole. Over 90% of the time, it's referring to the actual land and not the planet, whether it's globe right. or flat. So Right, right. Yeah, and and my friend also sent me uh, a, a video which I did send you. Did uh, Doctor Heiser? Um, yes. May he rest yes. in peace. Mm-hmm. Um, man, a lot of these guys have. It saddens me. A lot of these guys are dead now. Uh, Doctor Heiser was one, and uh, uh, Rob Skiba. That was another video I had sent to me showing the 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 uh, mirage effect of seeing Chicago across Lake Michigan, for example. Right. Um, you know, I, I have my disagreements with Rob, but, uh, yeah, it's still, it was, it still broke my heart. I mean, when he passed, uh, him and, uh, Dr. Heiser and whatnot, but, um, there were several things that Heiser mentioned in that video, which I had not seen before. Um, for example, he talked about, uh, very specifically how only it was only 500, even 500 years ago, they were still arguing whether you could sail off the edge of the earth or not. Mm -hmm. Um, that, Mm -hmm. that is actually patently false. So I was really surprised to hear him say that because (laughs) ironically, because I I actually dealt with that in one of the reasons we wound up here is because I had all these people asking if I'd had any videos on the flat earth, which I did not. The only one I had was a Crevo rant. I think it was one Oh seven. And, um, because I was out at Fogo Island in Newfoundland. And that was claimed by the Flat Earth Society to be one of the four corners of the Flat Earth. And so they've got monuments out there on the island and mm-hmm. a, a beautiful walking trails. So it's actually really, really well done. And if you're ever out there, get a chance, uh, do go. 
Um, so I went to, while I was on Fogo Island, I filmed a Crevo rant on that. Uh, it was actually an atheist of all people, Jeffrey Burton Russell, who pointed out that this was fiction. It was complete falsehoods. And that this whole concept of right. like Columbus, for example, uh, uh, everyone telling him he's going to sail off the edge of the earth and you can't actually get to the, the new land um, because the earth isn't a sphere. It's a, it's a you know flat plate. Um, that whole story is fiction. As we discussed last week, 300 BC, they had already measured the diameter of the earth. The circumference, mm -hmm. they had not only assumed it was a globe, Quite they accurate. had measured it. Mm -hmm. Surprising accuracy. <laughs> so, I mean, this so this whole concept, I mean, Jeffrey Burton Russell is no friend of Christians nor creationists. And he was the one that pointed this out. And it's in the British Historical Society's uh, number one spot for uh, historical myths. Uh, and in, and when they use that term myth, they're talking about falsehood. Right. It's just patently false. It's not true. Um, so anyway, I was surprised mm -hmm. by that. He he also said a lot of things right. in that video, which I I actually really liked. It was really thought provoking. Um, you know. Uh, but anyway, I, so why don't I let you take off uh, with what you were doing here? Because I got all your slides up here, and we can go with that. Otherwise, I'll ramble on. I want you to ramble on. Sure, and I, I'm, I know you have the, I know you have the passages, but I'm going to be jumping around a little bit. You know, um, I, I want to get into certain, uh, certain things and different things. I've, I've got and arrow I guess keys. The whole point I want to make is <laughs> excellent. So we're going to go down to Revelation 28, uh, verse eight, um, and what I what I really want to get at here is um, one thing I do find that flat earthers tend to do is they pick and choose what they take literally and what they use as a metaphor. When they talk about their corners of the earth and the pillars and all this stuff, speak as though it's literal. But if you read again the Bible in its context, it can't be taken literal. It is a clear metaphor or simile. And one of them to start it off is Revelation chapter 20, uh, verse 8. And he uh, and we'll go out to deceive the nations and the four corners of the earth. This is a big one with with flat earthers. The four corners, uh, they say, is that you know we look at it at, uh, biblically, and the four corners refer to uh, you know north, south, east, west. Uh, there are no corners, even on a flat earth. Uh, to be frank, uh, whether you're talking about flat or a globe, there are no corners. It's a clear metaphor, um, right? So it uh, would also apply uh, imply that they're according to their interpretation populated now we don't see nations we don't see uh millions or hundreds of thousands or even pockets of ten thousand here of people so what can you uh what god is clearly speaking you, of is nations yep you uh you dropped out so just because i think that's an important point but you dropped out just as you were making it so with the four nations, with with nations of the four corners, what does that imply? So, again, it, it I think it's it's very clear that the, the Lord is talking about uh, the four corners of the earth or the north south. It's the directions for north south east west. It has nothing right. to do with an actual ice wall. It would imply that the ice wall is inhabited by many nations and many people, but it doesn't say that. Um, that would have to be again inferred or in, uh, implied. Um, so that's an interpretation on Bible passage. Now there's many to follow, and you can go uh, Job, Psalm, uh, Isaiah, and we'll look at a few of them. So some of them that support it. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Great. So we're gonna go to Job 28 first. Yeah, Job 28, uh, verse 24. For he views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. Well, God is all-powerful, we know this. Whether it's a globe or a flat earth, he can see the ends of the earth. Uh, right. If he's outside of space, time, and matter, he created everything. He certainly has the ability and the power to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we'll look at the next one, which is Psalm 67, 7. My God, bless us still, so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Again, when they use these verses, 
the implication is that the ends of the earth, which they, uh, their definition of the ends of the earth is that ice wall, that would mean again that it's uh, very much populated. When in fact, it actually refers to nations and people outside of Israel. Right. Um, and then we can continue. I mean, the, the, the passages are numerous. Isaiah 45, cha uh, chapter 45, verse 22. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. Again, does that mean that the ice wall is populated? And where are these people? Where is the evidence to support that hypothesis? And make no mistake, it is a hypothesis. Um, right, right. So there, 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 there's just no evidence. And then when we partner that up with experiments and observations, we can see that there are no populations beyond that, uh, the, the, the so-called ice wall. Uh, I think it really just debunks the, the ice wall altogether. And I think this is their proverbial Bible. It's that ice wall. They have to have that ice wall. Um, if that can be shown to be uh, false, uh, then their whole their whole hypothesis falls apart. Well, let's go to one more, uh, Deuteronomy 28, 49. If you open up Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 49, the Lord will bring a nation against you from far away. Now, this is really important. From far away just means beyond the borders of Israel. From the ends of the earth. There it is again, from the ends of the earth, far away. So you would have to uh, uh, infer that these people are on the ice wall. Um, right. So again, it isn't speaking about a population beyond the, the, the earth as we know it and onto this ice wall. It's referring to nations beyond Israel and peoples beyond Israel. So the passages are numerous and they can go on and on and on. But this is just one example that really disproves um, the, the ice wall, I think. I think it's very powerful. Right, right. right. Okay. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Let me see. Oh, yes. So, we, uh, I wanted to take, I wanted to touch on this. This was a, there's another biblical principle here, which um, when we can, this, this is, this, this will sound kind of uh, strange, but indirectly through the Bible, through the scriptures, we can uh, verify the shape of the earth. How? Well, in the mouths of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And uh, we have, uh, mm -hmm. for example, uh, multiple eyewitnesses who have been to space who claim they've been to space they all agree with each other now you want to imply that nasa's paid them off or whatever fine but you're ignoring the biblical principle here and you are mm -hmm. flat out accusing them of lying of bearing false witness and many of these guys are christians uh charlie duke for example um let me one second i believe i even have a quote from him. Where did I put that? Boy, that that brings up something while you're looking for it. Um, yep. If you can go back and play, I should have had this one ready. If you can go back and play, if you recall, William Shatner, the Canadian actor, went yes. up into Jeff Bezos' ship, yep. I believe, <laughs> yep. and did his little voyage and stuff and he came back and he was just amazed and the earth is incredible and blah 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 and there's a clear border between you know a 50 mile um sheet as he called it a very thin sheet where the blue planet is below and the black skies and it's this and that but he actually used the word globe right i don't know yep. if you remember that i should have brought that one up i should have cued that one but yep. um, it is on youtube <laughs> you can check it out just that's true, yeah, because he, yeah, he was really impacted by that, by that oh, flight, goodness, yeah. and yeah. and I think he, I think he had a pretty good grasp, but just how dangerous it was, um, yeah. to be doing that. Which, unfortunately, I mean, that's, uh, it, that, did you did you follow that with uh, Mad Mike, the the flat Earth guy who was building his own rocket in his backyard? Yes, yes, yeah, and and, and again, once again, I'm I'm so sad that he. 
that he passed away, especially doing mm-hmm. that. I, I, I was cheering him on. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm a huge backyard science kind of guy. Right. So, I mean, I was literally cheering him on and I was, I was just heartbroken, but it, what he was doing was incredibly dangerous. Uh, Absolutely. No, get no getting around it. Well, you know, at the end of the day, again, this is not a bow. This is not a salvation issue. This, this is a, a right. you know, a talking point. This is a conversation that uh, both sides are having. And hey, let's do the experiments. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's check out the observations. Let's check out the Bible. If you know that's that's your thing. And uh, this is not a salvation issue. I got to make that very clear. Um, right. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you're saved by believing in a flat or a globe Earth. Um, right. But what an important topic for, for, for our viewers. Yep. And I'm afraid I cannot find that quote from Charlie Duke right now. Uh, hmm. But anyway, it, it was oh. a, it was basically a signed affidavit. The earth was a globe. He said it. Yep. Um, and uh, also Barry Butch. Now this video is on uh, YouTube. It is available. Um and uh, the link for it is in the references, uh, the mm-hmm. random references in the description of the video. Uh, so it will be there. Barry Butch Wilmore. Uh, so in April 2019 at uh, Answers in Genesis uh, at the Creation Museum there, uh, mm-hmm. he was there okay. and Ken, Ken Ham pinned him down. <laughs> He's like, okay, okay. In fact, this is, a, you know what? One second. I'll put it on the screen. Because we could do that. We have the technology and stuff. Well, you have the technology. Yeah, okay, well. <laughs> don't, don't put this in my hands. <laughs> but uh, Ham asked, he said, okay, go. the big question everyone's wanting to know, this is the big question. All right, when you get up for the first time and you looked at Earth, was it flat? Wilmore was emphatic. He said, no, it was not flat. It was definitely round. I can vouch for the fact that the Earth is indeed round. Uh, you know, if the speeds we fly at 17,500 miles an hour, you go all the way around the Earth at once every 90 minutes, and there's not a single corner anywhere on the Earth for sure. And also, Jeff Williams, and again, this, these links are in the random references in the video description. Uh, Jeff Williams also attested that the Earth was a sphere, uh, not flat, uh, when he was interviewed by Justin Peters. So those are all, uh, all those links are in the, uh, provided in the, the thing. Right there, we've got three witnesses. There's more, but right, right there was three. Uh, and as, this, as the scriptures tell us, in the mouths of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Why would these that's guys true. lie? Because they were paid and off by know, NASA? <laughs> that's, that's a great question that comes up actually quite frequently is, uh, why would, well, first of all, to for this to be a conspiracy, for this to be true, that the Earth is flat, the reason would be why. What do they get out of it, number one? Right. Well, number two, you would have to have space agencies and nautical charts and every captain of every ship and every and pilot. Multiple, multiple countries. Oh, my goodness, you, and you multiple countries think... and languages. Yes. That would all have to conspire together to uh, to hide the fact that it's actually flat. Yes, China China would just love to embarrass NASA. A North <laughs> Korea would love to embarrass NASA. Uh, all would. those guys, you know, if they had the opportunity, they would. Um, That's right. But, um, okay, so before we go yeah. on, was there any Absolutely. other uh, verses that you wanted to cover? Well, there's one in particular. I want to get back to the metaphors. Um, and yep. just going back to my point where many flat earthers will pick and choose Bible verses or even just little snippets of it, uh, but they'll stop there. And I want to make it clear that some of the most powerful verses that they use are easily debunked if we just continue reading. Uh, one of the very famous ones that I hear all the time is Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22. Now, if you yeah. listen carefully, it certainly sounds compelling. You know, he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. Well, wow, it's a circle. It's not a ball. And I hear this one from the most famous flat earthers. I see their videos. I've spoken to many of them. This one they really hone in on. It's a circle. I saw an experiment, and 
and I'll get back to the verse in just a moment. But in the experiment, uh, the, the gentleman took a ball, uh, like a beach ball, and he took a pen and he drew a circle. And he drew a circle. He says, how many circles can you draw on a ball? Infinite amount. So can the circle also uh, apply to a globe? Absolutely. But here's the most important, compelling part of it all. Let's continue reading. So Isaiah 40, verse 22, he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. But that's not where it ends. And its people are like grasshoppers. So wait a minute. Are we to take the circle of the earth literally as a circle? But we're not to take the grasshoppers literally? So who picks and chooses what we take as a metaphor and what we take as a literal thing? But that's not all. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy. Wait a minute. The heavens are an actual canopy? And spreads them out like a tent to live in. Well, so wait a minute. We're not on a flat or globe earth. We're in a tent. So right. again, the more research I do on, 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 on their Bible verses that they choose, I want to make this, I want to, I want to state this emphatically, that these are not the ones that I've chosen and picked and chosen out of the Bible. These are the ones that flat earthers use. And when you're right. when you're taken out of context, it sure sounds like the earth can be flat. But when you read the entire passage, it it's easily disprovable using the words in the Bible, using scripture. And this is a, a lesson that I learned many, many years ago. Mm-hmm. Many, and this goes for church leaders, this goes for just about anybody. The, the issue with the Bible, not that there's an issue with the Bible, that isn't it, but my point is people's interpretations of the Bible. And I remember one pastor saying, stop interpreting the Bible. Allow the Bible to interpret itself. If you continue reading, the answer is right there in black and white or in red. And that was the turning point for me uh, when doing any research that uh, that involves the Bible is allowing the Bible to interpret itself. And this is where I debunked flat earth biblically is just continuing to read the scriptures that they set forward. Right. Okay. Now one point, um, do you, uh, do, do you have anything else you want to add before I move on? Oh my goodness. Ian, I've got so much. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have four pages, but no. why, why don't you take over from this point and I'll jump in. Okay, okay. And I apologize. I couldn't find that Isaiah verse. I thought I had that oh, in the slide that I couldn't find it anywhere. Oh, I may have added to it and uh, didn't inform you. Well, I mean, I no, I, I had it in there. I mean, that's the, that is the most common verse. Clearly, I should have included it and I would have included <laughs> it. So I just obviously dropped the ball there. So, but anyway, you, you, gave the reference so um yep. so uh, another video that was given to me this past week by uh, uh one of my friend friends who was a a flat earther uh sent me uh rob skiba's video of chicago over the horizon on lake michigan and so you could right. see it from like 40 some miles away uh this is actually now i i steered clear this last week because it it, it takes some time to deal with it um because uh even before we started last week, just show us mm-hmm. the curve. Just show us the curve and we'll be done. The problem is once you do show them the curve, they will reject it. Or if the curve is not visible, they will embrace it. And this is exactly what Rob did. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I like Rob and I especially appreciated that he went out there and he got a boat, and he documented it all. Um, kudos to him. More power to him. Um, but this is this lensing effect, atmospheric lensing effect, is mm-hmm. uh, is pretty important. And the first place I actually ever encountered this, uh, where did my slides go? Nope, that's not it. Have you ever been to or heard of the mystery lights of Marfa, Texas? Yes. Yes. Oh, you have. Have you have you ever I seen have. them? Any uh, documentary? I've never seen them. No. Okay. So, uh, with regards to like um, 
uh, cryptozoology. So my good buddy, Herb Stein, he's big into cryptozoology. He's a huge cryptozoologist. Uh, all over the world, there are reports of what sure sounds like pterodactyls. Uh, still alive, flying around. Uh, Papua New Guinea is a hot spot. One of the biggest hot spots on the whole planet, the, mo the places of the most sightings, is northern Mexico and southern United States, by far and away. Uh, in particular, that whole Big Bend region of Texas, where Marfa is. Mm -hmm. So uh, all the, not all, but the vast majority of these reports, which cross language barriers country barriers cultural barriers uh the people in you know in the woodlands of papua new guinea are saying the same thing that mexicans in northern mexico are saying as well as americans in the south uh southwest us uh including people like police officers and school principals and stuff uh they consistently talk about these creatures these flying creatures as having glowing patches on their undersides, like fireflies, right. Right. bioluminescence. And so uh, Herb and I went down to Marfa, Texas, to investigate these the mystery lights of Marfa. Uh, the ghost on, lights. Yeah. Yes, on the possibility that it might be one of these creatures. Mm -hmm. And um, so when... Uh, when we got down there, uh, they, they've actually turned it into a tourist attraction. So that you take the highway out of town, it goes out in the middle of the desert, and they've got a rest area there. Very, very well done. They've got low-level low, low level, uh, shielded light ground lighting. So you can right. still see, but it doesn't interfere with your night vision. And uh, we got out there, and we set up the cameras. It's dark. And the lights just started popping out, like, immediately. Uh, right as soon as we got there and we're looking at this going what on earth is that uh there was out in the desert there was uh a, an, an antenna uh we figured it was probably we both guessed it was probably about a mile away so using that as a distance measuring uh a, a, an estimation that we figured that, you know so the lights would appear and they would uh fly down across the desert and then disappear and we figured they were probably going hundreds of miles an hour. That's is amazing. what we figured. Uh, there were bright white lights, and it w we were just like, "What is this?" And I, I'm videotaping it with my night vision camera. Right? It was, it was, it was cool. We had a lot of fun. We we uh, um, had a lot of fun investigating that. Long story short, what we saw, which doesn't explain all the stories of the Marfa mystery lights, what we saw was car headlights from a highway over 20 miles away. And wow. the desert heat created Refraction. this... Yes, it's a, it turns the air into a lens. So the That's best right. way I can describe it is um, you're looking through the edge of a lens. Right. And so you, so the light is bending all over the place as it goes through the hot air and the cool air on top. It just creates this giant lens because all the lens is, is different uh, densities of materials, light transiting right. from a less dense to a more dense to a less dense material. That's all that's going on there. And so it works with air. Uh, in the morning, because we were up all night, <laughs> and by the time the desert had cooled down, uh, in the morning, you could still see the lights, but it was obvious. It's just car headlights. So that, that antenna as well that we both estimated was about a mile away, we found it. It was 10 miles away. So wow. it's just, wow. we had this, this dramatic, bizarre distortion in the atmosphere. And uh, I, brought, I brought this up on the... Uh, the four part mini series I did in complete creation on UFOs, aliens, and uh, the abduction experience is right. um, one of the most common uh, reports and sightings of UFOs turns out to be Venus. And it's that right. Yep. Oh. It is probably the most common sighting of a UFO 
uh, turns out to be Venus, usually in combination with these bizarre atmospheric effects. Now, right. um, with uh, our our buddy here who uh, made the comments, I the reason I bring there's a couple of reasons I bring this up, but I want to bring up where is it? Here it is. Deer Park, 7777. He made a good point, which I wish to address and point to. So, if you recall, what he said, and this is what I believe many flat earthers believe, they believe the light is bending through a half-sphere electromagnetic dome. So, in other words, this bending of light has nothing to do with atmospheric conditions. So, this brings us back to Rob Skiba looking across Lake Michigan, where you do get atmospheric effects. So, when Chicago appears floating above the horizon and people 43 miles can see it uh, because of the lensing effect, literally distorting light coming from Chicago. They can see it on the other side of the lake where they should not be able to see it. And I totally agree with Rob on that one. Um, because of the curvature of the earth, you cannot see it. However, there's several things of note here. Number one, this is clearly an atmospheric event. Nothing to do with electromagnetism or anything of the like distorting or bending light, which I do agree with them on this. Electromagnet electromagnetism and gravity will distort and bend light. So you can actually see around solid objects and in behind them. It does happen. I totally agree. However, what the flat earthers that I've encountered all cite, it's always atmospheric effects. So mm -hmm. when Chicago appears floating above the horizon and suddenly you can see it from the far side of the lake, Notice, number one, this is abnormal. Everybody acknowledges this. Normally, you cannot see it. That's right. So why focus in on the abnormal to make your case? Right. And to, to give an idea of just how powerful this effect can be, uh, I have a couple of other, couple of other examples here, actually. While you're looking for them, I, if I could just comment on that, um, Joshua Nowicki is also a photographer. Yeah, amateur turned semi-pro photographer who also um, uh, took a shot of Chicago from the other side of the lake and so on. Oh, and yeah. he says, if you want to disprove, you want to prove the globe and disprove, disprove, I can't, this is not verbatim, by the way, disprove the flat earth. Go out every single day and take that same shot, and you'll never be able to do it. Right. The reason here is the atmospheric pressures, everything, the temperature, everything has to be just right for that refraction to take place. Right. If it was a flat Earth on a clear day, regardless of the weather and this and that, you should be able to see the skyline. But you absolutely, not. absolutely, and you don't because, and this is why, again, um, a number of uh, there was a, a debate, and I can't remember who it was, but uh, one of the uh, proponents of the Globe Earth was saying, okay, so any clear day, we're going to check the, the weather patterns and so on, any clear day, or every single clear day, I want you to go down and take that single shot, Chicago should appear, every single day, but it yep. does not. It has to be under certain circumstances, and, and, and it's very precise. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a mountain range. They did this very same thing for this mountains. You can see from one mountain to another. I have it in my notes somewhere, but uh, it was a very, very same thing. Um, and it, it all revolves around light refraction and atmospheric pressure and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. here's another example. Um, yeah. Where you get uh, <laughs> UFO. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's the, the effect can be quite profound. I mean, look at that. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, somebody threw the UFO in. Uh, but uh, I, let me give me one second here. I th oh. think, because I have that original picture. Oh, maybe this is it. Yeah. So you have a series of them here. 
just to give you an idea of, uh, you know, how profound the effect can be at times. Mm -hmm. So these were, these were ones that, uh, just appeared and it's just, it's atmospheric conversion. It's especially over water, which is a bit problematic because everyone, uh, is rightfully saying, go to the ocean and take a look because water finds its own level. So that's where you're going to see the curvature. And, uh, right. last week, last week, you remember, uh, Neil was one of the guys who we reproduced Eratosthenes experiment, right? Right. So Neil was out in Alberta. He was doing that part of the experiment out in Alberta. While he was at it, he went down. They live the the camp there was on a lake. He went down to the lake and snapped these photos. And here's what you can do to deal with the atmospheric distortion. And I encourage everybody to do this. Do do do. And thanks, Neil, if you're watching. He really went to town. He went, he went, uh, he went overboard and doing everything here. So what he did, very, very smart. And it was actually, uh, oh, he's a creation astronomer. Jason Lyle suggested this Jason as well. Jason Lyle. Yep. yep. So he suggested this as well. You can actually get to see if you do it right you can watch the sunset twice. Right. So go to the ocean. Stand up. Bingo. Yes. So get down as close to the water as you can. And as soon as the sun drops below the horizon, below the water, stand up again, and you will see it. And so Neil did exactly that here at the lake. And you can so, so you can look across. It doesn't show up very well here zoomed out but there he uh he's down real close to the water and you can actually see the line here which when you stand up suddenly you mm -hmm. can see more detail here and that lake is only right. oh i think two miles across um so he zoomed in and so here it is zoomed in you can clearly see the line basically right at the bottom of the windows right and when you stand up, you actually get a surprising, uh, a surprisingly different view. So this basically rules out distortion. Um, it atmospheric distortion. You're looking through the same atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So by doing this, you get rid of the atmospheric distortions. Uh, so right. this is another way of another thing you can do at home. Um, all right, let me close up. I have a lot of open windows here. And, and just touching on that as well, as I know one of the things, one of the experiments that it, uh, many people can do from home, well, from home, as long as you're, you're near water and a large body, body of water, is you can actually see ships not only getting smaller as they go, but they actually start disappearing bottom right. down. Right. Bottom yes. of the ship, that's, you know, and so on. Um, again, stand up, and you'll see a little bit more. And yeah, but you can see uh, the ships disappearing bottom first. Uh, right. I think that's a clear indication. Now, I know, like you said, uh, uh, refraction and so on can play with your eyes a little bit, and 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 so on, and bring that back into view. But it's, that's a whole different thing. Yes, it just mm -hmm. has to be taken into account. Um, now, a uh, buddy of mine on Facebook, so let me just check real quick, see if John responded. He has not. I, really, I was really hoping John would, uh, would come on uh, because John has actually been to Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And um, what I'm going to show everybody next, and then we better talk about calling it quits here um so let me open this up and i will show this image first just so we have a frame of reference it's an image we've already seen uh so antarctica oh. and before you change that image when you're done with your point 
Can you bring that yep. flat earth image back up when you're done? And I, I just like this to one? point something out. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the we we all are familiar with the land of the midnight sun <laughs> up in the Arctic. Have, have you been how far north have you been? Not very far north. Okay. Not at all. Northern Ontario okay. at, at most. Okay, even in northern Ontario, it's surprising the the difference. Uh, but oh, I mean, it is. like when I was up in high level Alberta, which is not yet Northwest Territories, it's about uh, two hours from the border, so two hundred kilometers or so south of the Northwest Territories border. Uh, even there during the summer, um, we're out working the rail yard. Uh, it was night shift uh, doing the yard work, doing the yard shift. And um, we'd only use our flashlights like two hours uh, during the summer months um, because the sun didn't set until like two in the morning before it got dark enough to use flashlights. And then right. by four in the morning, it, you don't need your flashlights. <laughs> you know. Right. Um, so the first time I went up to Hay River Northwest Territories, I was speaking at a Bible camp there. It messed me up, dude. I, I couldn't sure. sleep. It's like 11.30 at night, 11.30 p.m., and the sun is just blasting in the window on your face. And I'm like, oh, man, where are my sun shields when I need them, you know? Um, they, they need to be two inches thick. Yes, yes, apparently. Uh, where did... Uh, oh, is that it? I believe that is it. That is it. Okay, one second. Let me call okay. this up i will switch over to this one so we are all familiar with the land of the midnight sun oh i still needed that picture <laughs> uh so here we are with the north pole i can verify even though i haven't actually gone up where the sun doesn't set uh in northwest territories it did set as far north as i did uh, but I mean, just keep on driving. I can pretty much verify, even though I didn't go far enough north where the sun didn't set, it was pretty obvious what was going to happen. The farther I drive north, the more the sun is up at the same time of right. night. So, I mean, it's pretty obvious what's going on. So I don't think anybody would deny that the sun does not set at the North Pole. Now, in terms of flat earth, not a problem. Okay, so, you know, I, I won't go into, you know, the distances where uh, the sun is um, so far north that it isn't setting here, but you still can't see it uh, down in South Brazil where it's still daylight. Right. Uh, right. I won't I won't get into those issues. What I will focus on, however, is notice that Antarctica is around the perimeter in the flat earth model. So if I stand here and I'm looking this way, <laughs> I'm looking to, you know, towards the South pole. And if that sun is still there going around in a circle and never setting, you've got a problem. How on mm -hmm. earth do you explain that in a flat earth model? And that is exactly what we see. Now this is, uh, Again, this is uh, this happens to be on YouTube, so you can view this for yourself. Uh, I think this must be the one. Is that the one? Nope. Uh. I'll load it up a different way. What the guy did here, he'll show you at the end. Pretty slick trick. He's just got a camera on a tripod, robotic tripod. And he's just got it tracking the sun. And he stuck a stopwatch in there so he had an idea what time it was.
in a cloud cover, but you can still see the sun there, peeking through the mm -hmm. clouds. So there's his rig, just to show you exactly how he did it. Pretty slick little rig, actually. And uh, before I forget, um, there was something else I wanted to mention right off the hop, and we forgot. Uh, and it was pretty important, too. Yes. <laughs> um, do, you, uh, do, you want, do you want to talk about that? Um, whoops. If you could bring up that flat earth image one more time. I will. I came across something uh, this past week. I think it was like Tuesday or Wednesday as I was flipping through some of the information. A lot of videos. I was going through a lot of videos and, and kind of uh, dissecting them uh, both. You know, I was trying to be nonpartisan. So I was looking at both flat earth and globe earth and the pros and cons and the evidence and the observations and so on. One of the things that stood out for me was, according to their hypothesis, once again, the I believe it's the the um, moon that is roughly three or four thousand feet up, uh, miles. Sorry, if I forgot mistaken. about that. I never looked at that. Yeah. So a uh, uh, couple of things, a couple of pointers that to me it was actually very um, compelling, and one of them was if you were to be let's say on a South American continent, which you have in the bottom left there. Yes. And then you have uh, Africa and uh, Madagascar, the island of Madagascar to the right. Now, if the moon were just in a center, right between the two, mm -hmm. you wouldn't be looking at the same side of the moon, would you? If you were on South America and you were in Africa, okay. why is it we see the same side of the moon always no matter where it is, but if it's over the ocean, just between South America and Africa, you right. would be seeing two different sides of the moon. That's 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 a good point. Now, I didn't get into this last week, um, but uh, because I I didn't think it was how can I put it? I didn't think it was a a deal breaker for the flat Earth model. Mm -hmm. Many, not all, um, quick, quick off the cuff number, I'd say probably 50-50 of the flat earthers that I've spoken with, half of them probably believe that the moon is also flat. And um, oh, I haven't heard that one. Yeah, and they they oh, okay. claim that, uh, and, it, and it basically uh, turns, it rotates so that the same face is always facing the sun that which is why we only see one side of the moon now um that's but again if that were a disc mm -hmm. let's say it were a disc you would see different angles of the moon yes and different my... shadows that's right but uh, you don't. right and i actually got and north and southern hemisphere you see the moon actually inverted yes that, that would correct. not work on a flat earth model correct um also is this a better picture uh i did have so the that lunar transit that i filmed uh, a couple weeks back um yeah. of course i zoomed right in on the moon and you can quite nicely see the shadows in the craters. Mm -hmm. And so when you uh, take a look here, you can see the shadows, which presumably the light's coming from the sun. Some would claim that the moon is actually giving off its own light. You're starting to stretch credibility, to say the least, when you start pulling this stuff off. Uh, but in fairness, I'm just saying, you know, some would claim that the moon gives off its own light. You've still got problems there because the, sh the shadows are very clear 
Mm. you know, as you're going on this side, you start to even see the shadow on a spherical moon. So I steered away from this whole argument last week because it, as far as I was concerned, whether the moon was flat or a, or a dome didn't, or a globe didn't, it wasn't fatal to the flat earth argument mm-hmm. is, is the way I looked at it. Maybe I'm wrong about that. One could argue again, as the, as a, our first commenter uh, that I quoted um, saying about how gravity will turn everything into a, into a globe. It just will. And I agree with them on that one. Um, so I guess you could argue in that regard. Um, what was the other one? Oh, yes, yes. This was it. So, uh, I mentioned several experiments last, uh, last week that you can do at home. And, uh, so this is, I just got this up and running today. This is for the homeschool conference next week. So I mentioned, um, satellites. So this is a project that's on the go. This is all at the tech, uh, the tech Valley science center dot space is the address and this is where i'll be putting my projects for the cubesat and what you can't really whoops no that ain't working what you see here right here there are dozens and dozens of little circuit board satellites and so this project the way this works you get this satellite you build it and the plan is uh what is it doing here that's interesting i've never come across it hmm. oh there it is i'm not quite sure why i was doing that okay uh anyway uh so basically this cubesat this is just a mock-up i built um to figure out the rough design and everything you'll notice the measuring tape that's actually the antenna for the radio uh they all have to fold up and so when the doors when the solar panel doors open up uh, the measuring tapes flip out and uh, mm. basically deploy themselves. You'll see that in a lot of CubeSats. But right. the point is, these circuit board satellites, they have an antenna, they have a lawyer, LoRa transmitter for long-range, uh, it's Wi-Fi, basically. And it's very slow baud rate, but it will have sensors like a magnetometer, um, uh, uh, gyroscopes, so it can tell position. I want a camera on every single one of those. And it may take (laughs) two or three orbits to download one image off of your satellite. But by Jove, we are going to do it. Um, So this is a project. I'm looking at one to three years away. And I'm working really hard right now. Fortunately for us, there is a lot of competition uh, in rocketry to get these launched because so many people want to launch their CubeSats. Um, So right now I'm trying to get the price down to uh, $500 or less, which includes the, the circuit board satellite and the launch and a high altitude weather balloon, which is over here, a high altitude balloon. And basically, so from home, you build the satellite, the circuit board satellite, you send it up on a high altitude helium balloon. And those things can get up to like a hundred thousand feet. And you can do all this from home. So that's what I'm doing on this website is uh, these are all projects that I'll walk everybody through so that you can do these at home. When you send your satellite up on the high altitude balloon, you can test it. You can test the transceiver that you build as well. There's a global network of uh, volunteers who have this LoRa network. And these people just love to track these balloons and satellites. Uh, that's, right. that's, what, that's what they're there for, right? And so they all connect their, their uh, LoRa transceivers to the internet so we can access our satellite or weather balloon through the internet, through someone else's transceiver, even on the other side of the planet, wherever it winds up. That's right? pretty amazing. Pretty yeah, amazing. It's, pre- it's pretty, it's pretty neat stuff. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty hyped about that. This, uh, the other issue with this, with this CubeSat is um, I'm starting to work with uh, the first nations communities here in Canada 
And so this organization that I'm connecting in with, they, uh, they have schools connected to the network. There's like 142 of them, I think it was, literally all right across the entire country, including way up under the Arctic. I think the one school in reserve was at like 70, a latitude of 76 degrees. And so, um, wow. oops, why did everything just flicker? We're still on? Yeah, we're still on. Yeah, okay. we're good. I, all I my can screen. hear and see you. Okay, all my screens just went black for a second. Um, <laughs> oh, all right. You know, so, anyway. the second point I wanted to make had something to do with weather balloons. And um, so I'm gonna keep, get to keep the weather second. balloon. Say again? I'm going to go to there next. Okay. So, oh. so with these, the First Nations kids up at the schools in the high Arctic, so we need to get this CubeSat into a polar orbiting, uh, or into a polar orbit, because otherwise, right. this, this kids up in the high Arctic won't be able to receive it if it's on if it's not on a really steep, like between eighty and maybe a hundred degrees, of uh, on the on the poles, right? And also the plan is to uh, hopefully also get each of them to launch a high altitude balloon to test their satellite, test their transceiver, because especially up in these high Arctic places, internet, internet access is scarce. Uh, right. The, right. the video system that the, the organization uses for teaching, which is mostly what I'll be using um, Lord willing, uh, it, we actually have to book the the time with the Nunavut government because the bandwidth is so high and the bandwidth usage usage is so high and this, the bandwidth availability is so low we actually have to book the time with the Nunavut government just to be able to use the teaching system and so I'll be right. teaching all this from home right but of course shipping all the stuff up to them and then the the third thing which I mentioned last week is this is an actual uh, image from a polar orbiting weather satellite, one of the NOAA web satellites. And you can track these, you can capture that image just like that using uh, equipment that costs 50 bucks or less. Uh, you can buy it off Amazon, prime delivery, you can get it overnight. <laughs> uh, so it's software defined radio and you can literally build your own antenna. So I'll be explaining on the website as well with uh, video tutorials and everything, walkthroughs, how you can do all this uh, from home. Uh, once again, you can, because these are polar orbiting satellites. They're in right. orbit and they're in low Earth orbit, just like our CubeSat will be. And... Um, we may or may not be allowed to deploy the Pico satellites out of the CubeSat. I'm, that's part of the, the research I'm still looking into. Um, it's in a decay, what they call a decaying low Earth orbit. Basically, it decays right. to the point where it burns up and re-enters, right? Uh, they don't want space junk up there, especially because that I'm aiming for 300 kilometers, which is only 100 kilometers lower than the International Space Station. So these circuit boards would be deadly in space. So they need to decay and fall out of orbit, right? Um, so the way I've designed this is that the cameras will be on the edge of the circuit boards so that you can access pictures. So here's your opportunity. If all goes according to plan, you can buy one of these Pico satellites. You can build it yourself. You can stick a little Lego man in front of your camera or whatever so you know that's your camera your satellite core. whatever you whatever you want to do what's that i'm putting core on mine okay <laughs> you can do whatever you want you can take a picture tell it to take a picture and it will transmit the picture to you so you can see for yourself whether the globe is whether the earth is a globe or not uh same with the high altitude balloons you can send up cameras with them um and of course you can uh, down, you can capture these images as the satellite goes across to the sky because it scans. It does it one scan line at a time, right? Mm -hmm. And so it builds this image over that. That's probably about a 25 minute pass, uh, that one. But we've been doing this since 1990. Yep. Uh, we were, we were doing this at the science camp with the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were also capturing geostationary satellites. Uh, so I'll be showing you how to do all that as well on the Tech Valley 
space website. So Tech Valley Science Center, notice the Canadian spelling of center. <laughs> so it's R E. So Tech Valley Science Center, all one word, dot space will take you here and all these projects. So anyway, okay, you wanted to talk about weather balloons or high altitude balloons? Yeah, so high altitude balloons. Here was the second point in the one video that I watched in it. Again, very compelling. To me, it just stood out like a sore thumb and a great way for flat earthers to prove that the earth is flat. So can you go back to your map for just a moment? Map, which one? The flat earth map, sorry. Oh, yes. Okay, one yeah. second. And the point the gentleman made in the video, and again, it seems like the simplest way to prove your theory or your hypothesis. Um, to me, anyway, and I, I couldn't question it. I, I, looking through the lens of a flat earther, I would have to say, my goodness, why didn't I think of this? Right? Um, so we don't have the map up, but uh, or at least there I don't is. see it, but here we go. Here we go. Here we go. So, Chile. If you look at the southernmost part of Chile, almost touching Antarctica. Right? Yes. Isla, Isla. I flunked, I I flunked geography, that. by the way, just so you know. Okay, so did I. Um, <laughs> twice. No, just once. <laughs> but the southern part of Chile. So yep. here was this gentleman's point. He says, it's funny how flat earthers use weather balloons uh, in their their model to show that there are no satellites uh, floating around space. They're just weather balloons. Great. Let's use that as a foundation. It's amazing, though, that all of the imagery that comes from these weather balloons, if you look at the weather balloon as it's spinning around the Earth, the entire... Um, uh, space surrounding the weather balloon is uniform. It isn't like, oh, here's the ice wall on one side at 150 kilometers, and then on the other side as it's spinning, you know, here's another part of the Earth that's 600,000 kilometers away, whatever the case may be. It's all uniform as a weather balloon spins. Now, if you want to disprove a globe Earth, go to the southernmost part of Chile and launch a weather balloon. That's a very good point. A high-altitude weather balloon. Why anybody not? going to anybody going to Chile recently? <laughs> you know, so just go to southern Chile, which people have access to. All right, you know the our Antarctic Treaty. We're not allowed to go. Uh, governments are conspiring. First of all, that ring is astronomical in size. I don't know how any government can monitor that entire thing, even through satellites. But let's give it to them. Antarctic Treaty is true. We can't go to the Antarctic. Fair enough. We can go to Chile. The southernmost part of Chile, as a matter of fact. Let's go there with a number of high-altitude weather balloons uh, and high-definition cameras. Let's see the flat earth. Let's see that ice wall. Let's see, you know, um, if you want to disprove a globe, I think that would be very a very compelling way to do that. Um, I don't know, food for thought, but when I came across that in the video, I went, you know, I never thought of this. And maybe flat earthers have never thought of this. I don't know. I hadn't thought uh, of it. When you, yeah, but when you <laughs> go up in, when you go up in a, a, an airplane or a weather balloon with a camera, anything like that, and that that plane is turning around or the weather balloon is spinning, the mm -hmm. the the expanse of the planet that you see is completely uniform all the way around, all the time, and any part of the Earth, globe or flat. If it was a flat Earth, it would not be. Right, right. As long, as long as you're getting closer to the edge, to that, that ice wall, southern mm -hmm. Chile and so on, even maybe South Africa, uh, South Africa, Madagascar, uh, Australia, southern Australia, you would see that the as you go higher up in altitude, that the, it, it, the expanse wouldn't be uniform all the way around. Right. No, that's, that's a good point. So, yeah. So just well, something I wanted to throw out. There's nothing biblical about that, okay. uh, as we were trying to cover, but compelling nonetheless. Yes. All right. Well, you know what? It's late. Why don't we pack it up? And, Sounds good. Uh, so uh, just Beans was saying a disc moon is even worse. If you can see it from more than one side, it would be obviously, it would be, it would be obvious when viewed from the other directions. 
Hmm. Thanks, for, thanks for writing in, dudes. And thanks, everybody, for... Uh, so uh, Sorry, Alaska, I didn't see your comment about Zoom Closer, so I don't know what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> but uh, but anyway, uh, thanks, everyone, for for uh, joining us tonight. We'll call it a night because it's already been... Oh, it's only been an hour and 40 minutes. Uh, we, and we we've started like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although it's past my bedtime, so I gotta go. Agreed. <laughs> and and <laughs> thank you to you, Ian, for taking the time and, and putting this together. It's a it's a lot of work, it's a lot of effort, it's a lot of time, but it's well worth it for those that, that are on the fence. And again, this has nothing to do with your salvation. This has nothing to do yep. whether you're right or wrong. It's a conversation that we're having. And I think it's a fun conversation to have. Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. And it can be quite fascinating at times. Sure so. can. And, uh, anything going on with you next week do you want to talk about? You know what? I haven't given that any thought, but we can look at the list and put something together. Look. And all I'm going to tell people is just stay tuned. Are we going to use the same link as always? Uh, yes, it will be rumble.com slash user slash user slash live. Uh, but, um, uh, so uh, again, next week, I'm going to say Friday at 7 PM, same time, same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, yep. if I can get, uh, live with Bill Gibbons, um, okay. it, Good. it may be pre-recorded, um, and I'll just upload it or do whatever. Um, but I'll aim for next Friday because we still haven't even hammered down yet what day we would do the interview. And apparently he's got a cast of a footprint from Mokili and Bembi oh, that he, that, that he, fun. yeah, I haven't seen this. I just got told this a while, a while ago. So I want to see that. So I'm going to ask him to bring that so he can show it. So uh, on that note, you know, one topic I'd love to discuss at some point uh, through a podcast is uh, dinosaurs in the Bible or dinosaurs? Are they still alive, such as Machili and Bembe? Uh, but also, yep. like the soft tissues and red blood cells and all of that stuff, uh, Mary Schweitzer, and kind of go over yep. that information for those that don't know. I think it'll be an yeah. interesting topic. I, I, I agree. And the dinosaur and human footprints, that's a common one that I get all the time. And uh, it frustrates me because every second week I get another creationist who's never been to the Paluxy and has never looked at the evidence uh, spouting off their opinions about how they're all fake and they're not they're not human footprints and they mm. obviously don't have the foggiest clue what they're talking about a little frustrating but oh well um, but we Scoffers. should discuss it well Scoffers. yeah some, some of them are some of them aren't some. Um, some of them are genuinely they they they're genuine about what they believe. They're just genuinely sure. wrong. <laughs> so, but anyway, we yes, I agree. I agree. So those are good points. Okay, well, I guess thanks for everyone for joining us, and uh, stay tuned next week. Hopefully, we'll have Bill Gibbons on. And oh, I did talk to Alan Montgomery as well. So I warned, I gave him the heads Great. up, warned him we're going to talk about uh, global warming. Um, chemtrails came up again yesterday oh i love it yep you know hey can i make a suggestion maybe we can put down below under our names uh, if anybody wants an update first of all you can go to the link the rumble link but also if you want to check it out on uh, on on tiktok i do a whole bunch of videos not just on on globe and flat earth but go to al underscore vashon and v-a-c-h-o-n and i will do um pre-videos i guess to let you know what topics are coming up when you could view them okay. and what the link is so i'll sure. be sure to update that weekly for for viewers as well al underscore vashel good TikTok. plan good plan and i'll add that yeah. to the random references in the description as well and maybe your link as well That'll be great. all right okay excellent all right god bless everyone 